fossil record shows us that hominid evolution was primarily something that happened in Africa. Artipithecus has only been found in Eastern African, um, in Eastern Africa, in a geographic region now called Ethiopia. Australopithecus, from a wider geographic range, from Eastern Africa down to Southern Africa and over to cent into Central Africa. But the evolutionary history of the genus Homo is a much more geographically dispersed phenomenon. And this is why the evolutionary roots of our species, Homo sapiens, is complicated to figure out. How do you figure out when and where one species began and the older one ended when the geographic range for this spans across the entire three entire continents? Well, the fossil and archaeological evidence had led to the proposal of these two major models that you've already seen before. Two hypotheses. But the fossil evidence that we have isn't ideal for testing them because, well, first off, <laughs> those are the data used to, dis to derive the models, so you need something independent to test them. And two, because you can't, you can't read very specific ancestry from bones, as you were learning in your discussion section for this module. This is where the genetic sequence data used in population genetics comes in. That was the ideal independent data set to test these two hypotheses. Remember in the previous video when I introduced the concept of SNPs, a single nucleotide that has been altered by a mutation? So there are single nucleotides across the human genome that vary more often than others, and we call these polymorphisms. These single nucleotide mutations are really useful in population genetics. The importance of SNPs derives from the fact that a mutation happens once, and then it's passed down onto the descendants of of the person who had the mutation. So we call the person who has that mutation that, that is passed down through the generations, we call them a founder for that mutation. Everyone with the mutation is related. They have it in common because they are identical by descent. They have that founder in their ancestry. Now, these kinds of mutations are important because we can work backward to the founder mutations to reconstruct relatedness between populations and within populations. Okay, so let me add that in. So we can work backwards to these founder mutations to reconstruct relatedness between populations. Let me walk you now through a little hypothetical. All right, so we have um, this individual would just say that uh, they only have one chromosome, but they are diploid, so they have two copies of it, a, a blue one and a red one, and they get a mutation in that blue um, chromosome there. So meiosis happens, and you get recombination going on, and that mutation, you can see, is still there. It's in one of those sperm cells. Sex happens with black chromosome, and so you have um, here is now your chromosomal composition. Then individual grows up, meiosis. Notice there's some more recombination going on. Notice where that, that mutation is, is um, following. And then sex with green chromosome and meiosis. And then, ah, oh, that mutation is moved over. So you just have this tiny little part of the blue chromosome left because of the way recombination is happening, but that mutation is being carried down. And then you have sex with pink chromosome, individual grows up, meiosis, and on and on and on. So you have this constant reshuffling going on. There's actually a, a nice quote from a somewhat controversial uh, writer in, in um, evolutionary biology, but I really like this quote. Let me introduce you to it. Richard Dawkins from The Selfish Gene. Individuals are not stable things. They are fleeting. Chromosomes, too, are shuffled into oblivion, like hands of cards soon after they are dealt. But the cards themselves survive the shuffling. The cards are the genes. The genes are not destroyed by crossing over. They merely change partners and march on. But we can get the different variants of those genes and trace them as they have shuffled around through. Now let me let me add to this. So 
when we looked at phenotypic variation in the last module, we noticed how the difference between populations through time, it's that, that difference between populations through time, that's evolution. We can see that populations evolve, not individuals. And this is the key difference between Darwin's scientific theory of evolution compared to Lamarck's non-scientific explanation. So now, as we bring genetics into this, we move to the ultimate causation of that phenotypic variation, genetic variation. That genetic variation underlies the phenotypic variation that's inherited. So the kind of variation that can evolve. Now populations can be thought of in terms of genes and the different variants of those genes, or rather alleles. So evolution, so then populations can be thought of in terms of genes and allele frequencies. So evolution is therefore changes in allele frequencies through time. Let's, let's now use genetic variation to test hypotheses about um, how populations on the human lineage evolve through time. Specifically, let's use genetic data to test the multi-regionalism and the replacement models or hypotheses. For this, we are going to focus on mitochondrial DNA. And hopefully um, this rings a bell from your experience one of this module. If not, pause this video for a moment and go look it up. Mitochondrial DNA is found in the cytoplasm in the cell, inside organelles called mitochondria, which is quite different from the chromosomes. So where are your chromosomes found? Right, inside the nucleus of the cell. That's what makes us eukaryotes. But mitochondrial DNA is this cool little bacteria that started working so synergistically with a cell that they merged together. And now we can't live without them. Mitochondria, um, they change chemical energy from food into the kind of energy that our cells need in order to be able to do stuff, ATP. So cells that need a lot of energy have a lot of mitochondria and a lot of mitochondrial DNA in them. So for example, liver cells can have as many as 2,000 mitochondria in each one. And red blood cells, they have about zero mitochondria. <laughs> okay, so mitochondrial DNA is circular, unlike your nuclear DNA, which is in long strands and is, and is um, so the mitochondrial DNA is like then much shorter. And there's only about 16,000 base pairs in mitochondrial, in the mitochondrial um, genome, and only 37 genes. The other really important distinction between nu the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome is how you inherit it. The nuclear genome is half from mom and half from dad, as you know, but the mitochondrial genome is entirely from mom. So think about the egg cell. It's much larger than the sperm. This is because the egg cell provides the cellular machinery needed to make a person. And the sperm brings only the second half of the nuclear genome to the table, so to speak. This means that mitochondrial DNA is passed from mother to child, mother to child, mother to child. Men have mitochondrial DNA, but they don't pass it on to their children. Men only pass on nuclear DNA. This, this unilineal inheritance pattern, it makes, it makes it much more straightforward for ancestry studies. You don't have to worry about recombination. It's like studying a, a clone. Genetic mutations occur, but the inheritance is simple. Mutations arise, um, and then after it arises, boom, every descendant has it. The founder effect is really straightforward in mitochondrial DNA. So there are some other features of mitochondrial DNA that make it particularly useful for studying population genetics as well. So we've already talked about there being hundreds to thousands of copies per cell, but let me tell you um, why that's useful. Um, in the, that was, let me tell you why that was useful in the early days of DNA sequencing. The technique for sequencing DNA was very cumbersome, and the more copies of the DNA sequence you had, the easier it was to do this. So there is only one copy of nuclear DNA in a cell, right? Hiding away in the nucleus. So it's much harder to sequence nuclear DNA than the much more numerous mitochondrial DNA. So also, mitochondrial DNA um, uh, mutates at a much faster rate than nuclear DNA. 
No, actually, so we were able to completely sequence the mitochondrial DNA in 1981 because it was so much easier to sequence. Okay, so the mitochondrial DNA, it also mutates at a faster rate than nuclear DNA. And this is in large part because it's in the cytoplasm of the cell rather than in that protected nucleus. So the good thing here is that if you want to, stu to understand ancestry events that happened more recently in time, you need mutations, and mitochondrial DNA will have them. Nuclear DNA is, is a much more stable and less likely to have mutated over the hundreds of thousands of year time frame of recent human evolution. Oh, I also already mentioned the lack of um, recombination and that it is primarily in maternally inherited. And now, let me tell you about one of the most elegant and groundbreaking studies in population genetics. And the study, it was done right here on the UC Berkeley campus. So back in 1987, Alan Wilson, who you see here, he had two graduate students. Um, well, he was running a genetics lab over in Barker Hall. And Barker Hall is at the corner of Oxford and Hearst, so it's kind of right over there, although you don't know where I'm sitting. But anyway, I'm in Valley Life Sciences building. Okay, so he had two graduate students, Rebecca Kahn and Mark Stone King, and they were very clever, much like the graduate students today. Something to think about as you interface with your GSIs. Um, the discovery I'm going to tell you about was made by GSIs, Berkeley graduate students. <laughs> yeah. They're pretty awesome. So the ones that you're meeting today are coming up with the discoveries like this that we'll be looking at you know, 20, 30 years from now going, whoa, can you believe they did this? Anyway, back to 1987. So Becky and Mark um, realized that they could use the higher mutation rate of mitochondrial DNA and the higher copy number of mitochondrial DNA to work out how the variation that we see in mitochondrial DNA um, today, how that was patterned, how it evolved, how it was inherited. They knew that one of the most energy in, um, intensive tissues in the human body is the placenta, as this is the organ that supports a developing fetus, and therefore it is super rich in mitochondria, and therefore super rich in mitochondrial DNA. So they got tissue samples from 145 placentas and from two cell lines. One of these cell lines was the HeLa cell line, which you should be getting familiar with through reading The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. So if you haven't started reading that, now's a good time. <laughs> so Con Wilson and Stone King were really interested in understanding human genetic variation on a global scale. So they got those placental samples from women who represented five major geographic regions, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Guinea, and Europe. Once they had amplified the DNA and worked out the sequence for a small region of that mitochondrial genome for each of the 147 samples, they then counted up the number of differences between every possible pairwise comparison. So they took individual one and lined up the sequence next to individual two and counted up the number of differences. And then they did that for individual one compared to individual three and individual one and individual four and et cetera, et cetera, through every possible pairwise comparison. Then they plotted all those differences into a histogram that you can see here. So on the X axis, you have the number of differences and on the Y axis, you have the number of pairwise comparisons with that number of differences between them. This is a histogram. You've seen this before. It should look pretty familiar. We're just using different kinds of data. So the average number of differences is somewhere between seven or eight. Okay, so the average individual, any two individuals that you find, um, if you sequence their mitochondrial DNA, the region that Con Wilson and Stone King looked at, you'll find on average about seven to eight differences. Okay, <laughs> but what next? How do you do something with this? And this is the super clever part. Let me introduce you to the concept of coalescence. This figure shows 10 individuals across horizontally. Now the y-axis shows time, with G0 being generation zero, which is today. As the generation number increases, um, you're going farther and farther back in time. Now, 
let's work from generation 17 at the bottom of the screen, deep back, back deep in time, and we're going to move forward in time in the direction of the large light yellow arrow. Okay, so notice that G17 passed on the same allele of the gene to G16 and G15. Remember, these are generations, all the way up to generation 9. But then something happened between generation 9 and generation 8. A new mutation arose. A founder event occurred. And G9 had some descendants with the G17 allele and other descendants who had an entirely new allele. So G9, therefore, is the most recent common ancestor for those two alleles. G9 is the generation, the person who connects those two alleles. G9 is the most recent common ancestor, and that is where you then have the founder event happening right after that. Okay, so let your eyes now follow the red lines down from generation zero. It is possible to work backwards through this process. This is what Con Wilson and Stone King did. Now remember, Con Wilson and Stone King knew the sequences. Um, they, they knew how many differences there were between each individual in their mitochondrial genome sample. Um, so they not, only, not only did they know the number, but they actually knew what the sequences were. So they were able then to develop an analytical method that allowed them to work out the most likely pattern of the nesting for those most recent common ancestors of all the mitochondrial um, genetic variation. So you can get a sense of how this works by looking at this figure, where, um, where we are um, now considering the coalescence pattern of all 10 alleles at G0. All of them coalesce at G13, from which two major clades arose. And this works pretty much like the phylogeny you did in your first discussion section. You look for the pattern of who has which trait, or in this case, who has which sequence. So the more people who carry a mutation, the older the founder event occurred for that mutation, and the more people carry it because they have that founder event in their ancestry. Okay, so we're looking at shifts in base pairs. So people can have multiple differences in their base pairs. Okay, so let me let me show this to you again in a different way. Okay. So here we go. Another way to walk through this coalescence. So here, um, I'm going to show you colors that represent a, a difference in base pair. So we have two major groups, pink and blue. Now, the most recent common ancestor must be old because we will also see that there's a lot of variation within blue, the blue clade, that you never ever see in the pink clade. So the most recent common ancestor must be pretty deep in time. Okay, so now let's look at some of the variants that we see in that blue clade. So, for example, when we're looking at the blues, we also see that some of them have green and some of them have yellow. No pinks ever have green or yellow. So this means that that, the, the, that founder event must be uh, more recent in time than the blue and the pink. So here, we would place that here. And we know this because we also have these variants. So we have orange and turquoise. And so orange and turquoise are never found in those other, um, those other individuals. And so that must be a much more recent mutation event. And then similarly between lilac and black, that's more recent because you don't see that in any other um, individual. So it's this nested pattern. So basically, Con Wilson and Stone King, they figured out how to walk back that nested pattern of differences across those 147 mitochondrial DNA sequences. Okay, you're going to get to explore this in the discussion section in the next module, as it's absolutely fundamental to understanding how geneticists figure out ancestry from modern DNA sequence variation. So now I'm going to show you, oh, actually, go back for just a sec, previous. OK, so I want to show you the phylogeny of the DNA sequence variation that Con Wilson and Stone King um, developed. So they have every single individual plotted on their graph. So here you go. You got a little sneak peek, but it's really hard to see. So it's basically, you know, it's a phylogeny, like what you're used to looking at from earlier in the in the semester. But since it's too big, <laughs> they folded it around 
And I'm also going to flip this now so we can actually make it a little bit bigger and look at it um, a little more closely. Okay, so you kind of kind of want to turn your head to the left um, or just read sideways. Now, you see that they have um, color-coded the major geographic regions of their sample. So remember there were five, Africa, Asia, Australia, New Guinea, and Europe. And they're coded by color and by shape. Um, so the ancestor is there in the um, sort of on the over right hand side, the upper side. And notice that you have a split. You have two clades. On one side of the clade, you have all of those red circles that indicate Africa. And then you have another clade and basically everybody else is in that other clade, right? Oh, OK. So is that a distinction between Africa and everybody else? Oh, wait a minute. So start looking a little bit more carefully and you're going to see those little red dots. They're kind of all over the place. Wait a minute. Africa's everywhere. Okay, wait a minute. Now we can see Asia is in a lot of places, but actually it's kind of a little more Asia in some regions than a little more Europe. Europe is the blue squares. So bl blue is sort of clustered in one region at the bottom of the screen, but it's not a great cluster. Um, yeah, New Guinea kind of clusters over, over in the bottom right-hand side. Ooh, this is not simple. Hmm? So this is what they found, but let me summarize this for you. Basically, this is what they found. This is the summary. The mitochondrial DNA phylogeny of modern human populations is that you have Africans and you have everybody else nested within the variation in Africa. <laughs> so what they found is that most variation is in African populations and that the variation of other populations is subsumed within the variation in Africa. Africa. So Con Wilson and Stone King showed with mitochondrial DNA variation that we are all essentially African, but is this all that much different actually from what we already knew with the fossils? Maybe it's just basically telling us the same thing. Does, does this, does this data set actually test either the multi-regionalism or replacement hypotheses? Mm. No, it doesn't. But I'm not done. <laughs> there was another part of the study. And for that, you need to go to the next video. <laughs>